she never governs wisely. The colonies are not to be emancipated. All men are created equal. Victory or death. After the revolution's beginnings in 1775 and 1776, the middle years brought the American rebels the knowledge that their struggle for independence would not be a quick and simple war. At the same time Washington's army encountered one British army, Generals Benedict Arnold and Horatio Gates fought another in the north. On the wild American frontier, brutal fighting for different goals with different enemies raged. And in Europe, the mightiest nations on earth began to see a preoccupied, drained Britain as an easy target. The dogs of war had been unleashed, and no one knew how to harness them again. The Battle of Trenton is a part of one of the most magnificent campaigns of the American Revolution. The 10 days at Christmas, 1776, if Washington had done nothing before or nothing after, those 10 days would have guaranteed him a spot in all of our history books. Necessity, dire necessity, will, nay must, justify my attack. Victory or death. George Washington before Trenton. On Christmas night of 1776, Washington led 2,400 of his dwindling army to the banks of the Delaware River. He planned to cross the river and attack the enemy-held town of Trenton, New Jersey. His men were army regulars, not militia. By now, Washington was convinced that only a standing army could meet and defeat trained British forces, an army, he said, that would look the enemy in the face. It is fearfully cold and raw and a snowstorm setting in. The wind is northeast and beats in the faces of the men. It will be a terrible night for the soldiers who have no shoes. Some of them have tied old rags around their feet. Others are barefoot, but I have not heard a man complain. Colonel John Fitzgerald, Christmas, 1776. John Glover's Marble Headers, the same group that saved Washington's army through a daring nighttime evacuation from Brooklyn to Manhattan just four months earlier, saw to the dangerous task of ferrying the Continentals across the icy Delaware. Glover's men have had a hard time to force the boats through the floating ice with the snow drifting in their faces. I have never seen Washington so determined as he is now. He is calm and collected, but very determined. Colonel John Fitzgerald. The crossing took longer than expected. 
They still had nine hard miles to cover in order to surprise the enemy before dawn. Surprise was possible in no small part because of the work of John Honeyman, a spy of Washington's who had infiltrated the British paid German mercenaries, commonly called Hessians. Throughout the war, I should add, Washington was his own spy master. He, he ran all kinds of spy rings inside the British Army and inside British, the British cities like New York and Philadelphia. But Trenton was his masterpiece. And Honeyman went into Trenton and befriended the German commander. His name was Johann Rahl. And Honeyman told uh, 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 Rahl, oh, I've been over on the other side of Delaware. Washington's army has fallen apart. There's nothing left. He's gone. You know, he's the, there's nothing. Don't worry about the Americans. Have another drink, Colonel, and so forth. Honeyman, meanwhile, would get back to Washington and give him a complete breakdown of every move the Hessians were making, the disposition of all their sentries, uh, the whole operation of this uh, Hessian outpost there at Trenton. At 7.30 in the morning, in a sleet storm, the American forces surprised the Hessians, still groggy from their Christmas festivities. There are probably no troops, British, Hessian, or Loyalists, that would have stood uh, against the Americans at Trenton. They were caught totally by surprise. They were disorganized, and they really didn't know what was going on. Plus, the weather was bad, and it was hard to fire their muskets. The Hessian commander, Spence, after a Christmas night of drinking and gambling, tried to rally his troops. We could hear him shouting in German, My brave soldiers, advance! His men were frightened and confused, for our men were firing upon them from fences and houses, and they were falling fast. It was not long before Rawl tumbled from his horse, and his soldiers threw down their guns and gave themselves up as prisoners. Colonel John Fitzgerald. Mortally wounded, Rawl surrendered his sword to Washington. The American commander took 900 Hessian prisoners. This was the victory that Americans had to have in order to turn the whole thing around. It went through the, the spirited American colonies like an electric shock. You know, all the way from Carolina to Boston, the news went out that we'd won one, finally. Four days after Trenton, Washington made an emotional appeal to the disintegrating core of his army. The Continental Regulars, who had actually enlisted for service, rather than simply volunteering as militiamen. For many, their one-year enlistment would end in two days with the new year. My brave fellows, you have done all I asked you to do and more than could be reasonably expected. But your country is at stake, your wives, your houses, and all that you hold dear. You have worn yourselves out with fatigues and hardships, but we know not how to spare you. If you will consent to stay only one month longer, you will render that service to the cause of liberty and to your country which you probably never can do under any other circumstances. The present is emphatically the crisis which is to decide our destiny. George Washington before Princeton. After the speech, 200 volunteers stepped forward to renew their enlistments. Within days, they would see battle again as Lieutenant General Charles Cornwallis pursued them from New York. The British came at him with every man they could find. They had about 10,000 men, and they, they had him pinned against the bank of the Delaware, and it looked like it was all over. And Cornwallis, the British commander, said, oh, we won't attack tonight. We'll finish, the, we'll finish them off tomorrow morning. Washington left all the campfires of his army blazing and left like three men to throw wood on the fire, and he 